the painter, Fernand Leger, writing to his friend André Marie, December 1918. Finally, after four long years of warfare, exasperated, keyed up, depersonalized man opens his eyes, takes a look, relaxes, and rediscovers life. Gripped by a wild desire to dance, let off steam, at long last stand upright, shout, scream, and squander. A hurricane of life forces fills the world. Seven in the morning. A succession of furious, choking yells from the street. Madame Mons, who kept the little hotel opposite mine, had come out into the pavement to address a lodger on the third floor. Her bare feet were stuck into sabots, and her grey hair was streaming down. Sacré salope! How many times have I told you not to squash bugs on the wallpaper? Do you think you bought the hotel, eh? Why can't you throw them out the window like everyone else? It's best to tiny! The woman on the third floor. Va donc, et vie vache! Thereupon, a whole variegated chorus of yells, as windows were flung open on every side, and half the street joined in the quarrel. The Rue de Coq d'Or was a narrow street, a ravine of tall, leprous houses, lurching towards one another in queer attitudes, as though they'd all been frozen in the act of collapse. All the houses were hotels and packed to the tiles with lodges. At the foot of the hotels were tiny bistros, where you could be drunk for the equivalent of a shilling. On Saturday nights, about a third of the male population was drunk. Dear it, 
Paris, where entertaining has long been an art, parties have always been taken seriously, even by those who aren't invited. The party of Signor and Signora Alvaro Guevara, the former Merol Guinness, was an as-you-were-when-the-autobus-call party, owing to the fact that the guests warned that the Sharabank would call for them at no specified hour, were to come in whatever attire was theirs when the chauffeur tooted his horn. Among the artfully unfinished costumes was that of one guest who had exactly one side of her face made up, a gentleman clad in shaving soap and a hotel towel, and several ladies in half-fastened skirts. The Rue Notre-Dame des Champs, accustomed both to the Café du Dôme and the Grand Chumière, the great life-class atelier in Montparnasse, is still discussing the Sharabank party. Far a frissir mon vin de sorte qu'il va s'en vin de la glace. Fais venir j'aime que la porte solide pour dire une chanson. Nous ballerons tout trois au son. Et dis à Barbe qu'elle vienne, les cheveux tournent la façon d'une folate italienne. Vois-tu que le jour se passe? The May 1920 premiere of Stravinsky's Pulcinella, with choreography by Messine and scenery and costumes by Picasso, was every bit the success that Diaghilev and Stravinsky had hoped for. The guests were therefore in a celebratory mood as they headed into the suburbs for the after-performance party, a memorably over-the-top affair given by Prince Farouz of Persia. The revelers, including Picasso, Cocteau, and Raymond Radiger, who immortalized the party afterwards in his La Balle de Comte Poulenc, and of course Diaghilev, Massine, and Stravinsky, arrived in a caravan of automobiles guided by hired hands with flashlights. Prince Farouz was un haute magnifique, who generously lubricated his guests with vast quantities of champagne. Not surprisingly, the party got a bit out of hand after a very drunk Stravinsky perched himself precariously on the balcony that ran around the huge dance floor and hurled cushions and bolsters from the adjoining rooms onto the guests below. This led to a pillow fight that lasted until three in the morning. As for the role Coco Chanel played in the Stravinsky story, two things are known. Chanel provided the funds for the December 1920 revival of Rite of Spring, and she provided a home to Stravinsky and his extended family after they left Switzerland for Paris. Beyond that, there's only rumor, conjecture, and Chanel's own vague account. According to Chanel, the only man I felt attracted to in the, um, among the artistic set was Picasso, but he was not available. Stravinsky, though, pursued her, 
When Chanel pointed out that he was married, Stravinsky replied that his wife was well aware of his love for Chanel. To whom else, if not to her, he demanded, could I confide something so important? The affair, however, came to an abrupt end. Stravinsky went with the Ballet Russe to Spain, leaving Chanel alone. The Grand Duke, Dmitri Pavlovich, then appeared. Stravinsky received a telegram to the effect that Chanel preferred Grand Dukes to artists. Stravinsky exploded. Diaghilev sent Chanel a telegram. Don't come, he wants to kill you. And that was that. <laughs> Mon maître est un volage, mon rival est heureux. S'il a son fuselage, c'est que dans la ville évoque la galère, tant qu'elle, tant qu'elle, évoque la galère, tant qu'elle pourra voguer. Ma maître est un volage, mon rival est heureux. S'il a son fuselage, c'est que dans la ville, la 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 Et bonne la galère, tant qu'elle pourra voguer. Chanel's whirlwind affair with the glamorous Russian exile, the Grand Duke Dmitri, was brief, but by her account, captivating. According to an unsubstantiated but persistent story, they were introduced by Dmitri's current lover, a friend of Chanel's, who is supposed to have told her, if you're interested, you can have him. He really is a little expensive for me. Chanel was interested, but not for long. Later she recalled that oh, those Grand Dukes were all the same. They looked marvellous, but there was nothing behind. They were tall and handsome and splendid, but behind it all, nothing. Just vodka and the void. It hurts when one gets dumped. Diaghilev's ballet has presented Le Fils Prodigue by Prokofiev. The choreography was by Balanchine, and it starred the witty, graceful, brutal, burlesquing intellectual legs of the Russian ballet. psychology in their muscles as well as in their minds, the dancers in their geometric contrapuntal routines and facetious pantomimes annually make for a complex, good-natured entertainment, mistakenly offered a public which solemnly yearns for what it used to call modern art. As it is a matter of fact, it's getting it. Flow! 
A Paris couturier once said women's modern freedom in dress is largely due to Isadora Duncan. She was the first dancer to appear uncinctured, barefooted, and free. She arrived like a glorious bounding Minerva in the midst of a cautious, corseted decade. The clergy, hearing of, though supposedly without ever seeing, her bare calf, denounced it as violently as if it had been golden. When she moved across the stage, head reared, eyes mad, scarlet kirtle flying to the music of the Messiahs, she lifted from their seats people who had never left theatre seats before, except to get up and go home. Ne crabe sans sur ses poids, avec ses bras encore belles, il sourit jusqu'aux oreilles. La danseuse d'opéra, au crabe tout est pareil, sort de la coulisse boîte. Coco Chanel was continuing her role as Lady Bountiful in Paris, underwriting Diaghilev's productions, entertaining brilliantly, and paying for Cocteau's frequent detox visits. By now, Cocteau was living at Chanel's lavish Rue de Faubourg Saint Honore residence with his new lover, Jean Desbordes paid for in part by the sparkling wit with which he enlivened Chanel's dinner parties. But the main idea behind Cocteau's residency seems to have been Chanel's effort to impose some constraints on him and get him off drugs. A not very successful effort, it turned out, since he spent much of his time with Desbord smoking opium. Se permis de fumer As Ernest Hemingway wrote, the circus is the only fun you can buy that's good for you. Oh! 
the novice French film director René Clair had the opportunity to make a short intermission piece titled, appropriately, En Tracte, for the Swedish ballet's production of Picabia and Satie's ballet, Relâche. The ballet provided perplexing entertainment, including a dance with a wheelbarrow, a dance with a crown, a dance with a revolving door, and men plus one woman dressing and undressing on stage. Mon chapeau qui stand seul In on track, a crowd of mourners follow a camel-drawn hearse, first in slow motion, then ever faster, as the hearse escapes the camel and the streets fill with racing cars. After a hectic roller coaster ride, the coffin spills onto a field where the corpse steps out as a magician who makes the mourners disappear one by one. Barbette, who performs his high wire and trapeze stunts dressed in female attire, has opened at the Cirque Medrano. In his honour, there assembled at the ringside a two Paris audience, such as formerly gave colour to the Segal and chic to the Diaghilev Ballet. For his triumphal entry in his first scene, he wore, besides his diaphanous white skirts, 50 pounds of white ostrich plumes. He was photographed by Man Ray and had a brief affair with Cocteau, who described him as no mere acrobat in women's clothes, not just a graceful daredevil, but one of the most beautiful things in all theatre. Se découvre le derrière. The Death in Misery of La Goulou, one of the greatest demi mordaines of the 90s, petted can can dancer of the then devilish Moulin Rouge, model for Toulouse Lautrec and some of his most famous cabaret canvases, and general toast of the whiskered town, afforded her a press she had not enjoyed since her palmiest days. 
rising by natural stages from the sidewalk to the ballet of the Moulin Rouge, her triumph came when bankers and impressionists drank champagne out of her shoe. She did the splits amidst the 60 yards of lace trimming of her stylish long skirt. She had charm, a dazzling complexion, and wit. It was the last great heyday for courtesans, and she made hay. Colette, the librettist for Ravel's opera L'Enfant et le Sautelège, was known for her scandalous lifestyle, as well as for her success as a novelist. She proceeded from a brief affair with Natalie Clifford Barney to an extended one with the Marquise de Bellebeuf, known as Missy, with whom she performed at the Moulin Rouge in an act that culminated in a scandalous, erotic, on-stage kiss that created a riot. Colette engaged in affairs with men as well as women, becoming involved with the Italian writer Gabriel D'Annunzio, as well as the wealthy playboy Auguste Herriot. By 1921, she had been married for several years to the editor of La Matin, Henri de Juvenel, with whom she had a daughter. But in an interesting turn, she had also entered into an affair with de Juvenel's teenage stepson, which would lead to her divorce. announcement in journals that Liane de Pougny, the Princess Gika, is to divorce has stirred society and memories here. Today, she is a beautiful 60. Under the first days of the Third Republic, she was its young shock and delight. She was launched to the Folie Bergère by Edward VII, then Prince of Wales, to whom, though he did not know her, 
she sent a note saying, Sire, tonight I make my debut. Deign to appear and applaud me, and I am made. He did, and she was. Shortly after this, men began dying for her. She made suicide fashionable. Every Parisian who could afford it fell in love with her. Now at 60 and still rich, she will divorce her prince, whom she met and captivated one night in the Moulin Rouge, where, because she had been mistakenly given his box by the usher, she threatened to take off every blue garment she wore, including her silken stays, and which she enumerated, all of which she promised to throw at his head if he tried to make her move. As her explanation for her legal process now, she only remarks, I've always been a victim of love. She has already filled 80 small volumes with the history of her life. These have not been published, but have been accepted as a legacy by the Bibliothèque Nationale. Court Zart's ball was more than a mere party, but a real climax to the entire year. Weeks before the party, the committee would announce the ordained costume of the year. In 1924, it was early Phoenician. When I say costume, I'm referring largely to what went on the head, for it was agreed that over the body, the men would wear little more than a loincloth, while the women wore only short tunics which reached from breast to thigh. The rest of the body was coated with bronze red dye, and the feet were either bare or shod with light leather sandals. Inside the huge hall was a sight hard to describe. There must have been 2,000 men and women in that enormous room. Some still retained their costumes, a few had abandoned them entirely, and before the evening was over, most of those present were completely naked, except for the red paint. That this state of nudity was prearranged was proved by the fact that the red paint had been applied to all parts of the body, and not merely to the skin left exposed by loincloth or tunic. Two orchestras played, and the crowd danced while from a series of small and secluded balconies, others threw streamers and confetti down upon the dancers. I cannot go into details as to some of the things that happened that evening, especially in the balconies, and unfortunately they cannot safely be left to the imagination of my readers, because the normal imagination is inadequate. <laughs> 
Nous aimons toujours et de s'épouser car il faut faire l'amour sans tirer ni notaire. Si c'est messieurs, dit Crépouseur, ne vous y coutirez ni rien, 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 ne vous y Et c'est mes soeurs, dit Tripoussard, oh la messie ne visait plus qu'au corps. Pourquoi se marier quand les femmes, quand les femmes, pourquoi se marier quand les femmes des autres ne se font pas prier? Mais il faut pas prier pour devenir une autre Quand leur faveur, quand leurs ardeurs Cherchent nos tirelires, cherchent nos tours à l'our Cherchent nos corps By now, Ernest Hemingway had become quite taken with the many possibilities for love affairs in Montparnasse. As he wrote to his friend F. Scott Fitzgerald, To me, heaven would be two lovely houses in the town. One where I would have my wife and children and be monogamous and love them truly and well. And the other where I would have my nine beautiful mistresses. Il faut s'aimer toujours et ne s'épouser guère. Il faut faire l'amour sans tirer ni notaire. Si c'est messieurs, dit Tripouzer. Si c'est messieurs, dit Tripouzer. La 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 la. Et c'est mes soeurs, dit Tripoussard, oh la monsieur ne visait plus qu'au corps. When we came back to Paris, it was clear and cold and lovely. Now you are accustomed to see the bare trees against the sky. And you've walked on the fresh washed gravel paths through the Luxembourg gardens in the clear, sharp wind. The trees were sculpture without their leaves when you were reconciled to them. And the winter winds blew across the surfaces of the ponds, and the fountains blew in their bright light. Sur 
With so many trees in the city, you could see spring coming each day until a night of warm wind would bring it suddenly in one morning. Sometimes the heavy cold rains would beat it back so that it would seem that it would never come and that you were losing a season out of your life. This was the only truly sad time in Paris because it was so unnatural. You expected to be sad in the fall. Part of you died each year when the leaves fell from their trees. But you knew there would always be spring. But when the cold rains kept on and killed the spring, it was as though a young person had died for no reason. <laughs> Maurice Rostand certainly knew about the Cabaret de Neon. Maurice Rostand, son of the immortal Edmond, is one of the most amusing young men in Parisian literary, or to be more exact, aesthetic circles. He is truly the poet fatal. He is always a study in black and white. He wears very high heels. He rarely covers his long black hair with a hat. He's also one of the few people alive who can wear a flowing tie and give the impression that it's the most natural thing to do. When he recites his poetry, he slips out onto the stage almost surreptitiously and stands quite at one side before a blue-bordered grey velvet curtain clasping the drapery with his wan, pale hands. However, Jean Cocteau was the ubiquitous poet of the age. Picasso once remarked that Cocteau was becoming terribly famous. You'll find his works at every hairdresser's. The newspaper, Paris Midi, asked Cocteau to write a weekly article on the Paris scene, a series that Cocteau called Carte Blanche. 
It was while he was writing this that he met the 15-year-old poet Raymond Radiger. It will be an understatement to say that Radiger was precocious. His poetry was astonishing, astonishingly mature, as were his relations with an ever-growing number of Paris's avant-garde. Cocteau, who later said that he sensed his star, fell madly in love with him. Jean Hugo called Radiger silent, sulky, arrogant, amazingly mature in his judgments, certainly not affectionate. But Cocteau was in love, even though he saw into the black depths of Radiger's psyche. <laughs> Soon the relationship went topsy-turvy with Cocteau seeking Radiger's approval even in literary matters. Cocteau naturally brought Radiger to the group de Cis Saturday dinners, where the young, men practiced, the young man practiced his intimidation techniques to perfection. Radiger was writing publicity articles for Sati, for the group de Cis, and for Cocteau's new book of poems, Poésie. With the publication of his own volume of poems, Les Jus en Feu, the literary avant-garde hailed Radiger as the greatest young prodigy since Rambo. <laughs> Radiger was proving a handful, even for Cocteau. This young man, unquestionably a genius, but at 17, still a hormone adult teenager, was driving Cocteau wild with his drinking, difficult behavior, and frequent disappearances. On top of that, Radiger was now threatening to marry a girl he had met, not because he loved her, but because he refused to become a 40-year-old man called Madame Jean Cocteau. Thank you. 
In December 1921, a painter and photographer from New York called Man Ray arrived in Paris. He noticed an attractive woman and her friend at the Café Rotonde. The waiter had refused to serve them because they were not wearing hats. The prettier of the two became irate and shouted that a café was not a church, and besides, all the American bitches came in without hats. The manager arrived and tried to reason with her, telling her that since she was French, the fact that she was sans chapeau and unaccompanied might lead some to mistake her for a whore. This made the woman furious, but Man Ray's companion, the painter Marie Vassiliev, knew her and invited her to join them. And that was how Man Ray met Kiki. They became lovers soon after they met. She had already become a popular model in Montparnasse, as much for her jaunty good humour as for her beauty. But now that she was with Man Ray, she would no longer pose for painters. Instead, she worked with Man Ray in no more than 40 photographic sessions over the coming years. Their eight-year love affair and professional collaboration becoming a byword for 1920s Montparnasse. De ton talos, fidi ton changir en rocher sur les montagnes de Phrygia. Et la fille de Pondio fut faite hirondelle. By 19... By 1929, the relationship of Man Ray and Kiki was disintegrating, and Kiki was looking elsewhere not always successfully. When the art dealer Julien Levy declined to sleep with her, she famously shot back, Tu n'es pas un homme, mais un homme Hemingway acerbically alluded, Kiki still has the voice, and her face is as fine a work of art as ever. It's just that she has more material to work with now. In fact, all of Paris was changing. 
Janet Flanner mourned the passing of a beloved institution. We grieve to announce the passing of the old flea market. This superb rubbish vending agglomeration was founded in the 13th century when Paris was the pride of Christendom. And 600 years later is abolished in an atheistic century for infringing on the Sabbath selling laws. Among the various city gate weekly ragmarts, the Kremlin Bicetre at the Port d'Italie, the Montreux at the Port de Vincennes, the fleas at Clignancourt will remain in the memory as the most famous and satisfying. Among its fields of black mud was always to be found the choicest rubbish, the better cracked ivory miniatures, the daintiest slightly broken Venetian glass pitchers, the smartest almost new single riding boots, usually lefts. From the fleas sprang the present cult for the fine floral Louis Philippe glass paperweights to be had before the war for 10 sous and now selling for around 200 francs. Here was anything you wanted, from old radio sets to brand new 14th century antiques. It was the spirit of liberté, égalité, and fraternité that attracted so many Americans to Paris. There was no prohibition. Man Ray wrote to his brother that Paris was a big Greenwich village, but with wine and beer everywhere. Racism, which remained a bitter fact of life in America, almost disappeared in a Paris that was in love with African-American jazz bands, and homosexual relationships were accepted if not always with enthusiasm, at least with a shrug, in a country where homosexuality had not been banned since the revolution. By 1925, an estimated 400,000 Americans visited Paris annually. In 1920, 8,000 lived there. By 1923, this had grown to 32,000. Regarde par-dessus ses besicles de futaine. Ses yeux sont des gros massifs, dépourvus de jolies teintes. Je pense à casa dessus qui 
Josephine Baker hit Paris like a bombshell. Not only was she gorgeous, but she made an electrifying entrance, virtually nude and slung over the shoulders of a muscular black dancer named Joe Alex. Everyone who saw La Revue Negre that night at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées remembered her. How could they not? But her own most treasured memory of that unforgettable opening night in Paris was quite different from the one her smitten audience carried away. What Josephine Baker remembered was that after the show, for the first time in her life, she was invited to eat with white people. show at the Folie Bergère, she added a new element to her routine by donning a belt of bananas, and she continued to wow her audiences. Jean Cocteau later took credit for the costume, as did Paul Poiré, but it didn't really matter who thought of it first. The skimpy skirt of bananas was supremely funny as well as sexy, and quickly became Josephine Baker's symbol, which has endured. Another symbol was her diamond-collared pet leopard, who she took for walks along the Champs-Élysées, a dazzling addition to the brilliant City of Light. There were also many Russians living in Paris, exiles from the revolution, including the Yusupov family. The noble Yusupov family seems born for common bad luck. Since his arrival in France, the present prince has already been identified with a losing lawsuit over some Rembrandts, with the bankruptcy of a dressmaking shop, with the murder of Rasputin, and with a subsequent small scandal that has threatened deportation. He's now up to his ears again, but this time it's poison. It seems that his valet encouraged another valet to put scopolamine in the tea of the latter's masters and their guests, of whom the poor Yusupov was occasionally one. The polite poisoning has been going on for months, According to the Comtesse de la Renti Tolosan, born Princess Demidov and therefore kin to Yusupov, whose hereditary hard luck the poor lady is now beginning to share. 
in interviews to the press, read by a delighted, incredulous countryside, the lady explains the state of gargaism which Scopolamine produced on her noble family and all their tea-drinking friends. A state of complete stupidity, which none of these aristocrats found strange. Memory vanished, general conversation lagged, casual guests popping in for le five o'clock were led back to their limousines in a state of complete imbecility. And an aunt, the Duchesse de Lune, Bon Duze, the Comtesse interpolated for the benefit of her democratic public, fell flat on her face, which was abnormal for her grace, after having sipped a cup of weak orange pico, and broke her arm owing to her sudden inability to stand on one leg, the Comtesse added in a statement of sweeping lucidity. The hilarity among red-blooded mortals caused by these blue-blood disclosures has been as good as a revolution. One of the most popular citizens who ever caught the Parisian eye has just been sentenced to 10 years in a Lyonnais prison and 10 in exile. This is Georges Rennes, who has already escaped from six of the best French jails. Fortunately, Monsieur le Juge, he murmured with a winning smile, I'm young. However, he added later to his advocate, I doubt if I stay in prison at all. The climate of Lyon does not agree with me. I fancy that my sentence of ten years is an idle theory on the part of the bench. You may be right. I have always had two charming weaknesses, he told the jury. Ladies and gambling. His advocate in defending him, Rem had already been convicted 17 times for theft, argued in part that his client was a character in the best French tradition, on account of his intelligence, his imagination, and his wit. In sad periods, he is one of those who help to amuse the masses and distract them from the preoccupations of their minds. Of all the criminals in recent years, only the murderer, Landru, was more popular at distracting the preoccupied masses, a dozen or more of whom, female, he had previously amused to death in his country retreat. The hotel servant girl, who found the Conde Rose diamond Rem had stolen by biting into its hiding place in an apple belonging to one of the hotel's guests, was promptly sacked by the management for her dishonesty. Yeah, right. 
the funeral of Raymond Radiger, who died on December 12, 1923, was a heart-rending affair. To begin with, he was young, only 20 years old, and his death was totally unexpected, at least until the very end. His typhoid, contracted late that summer, had developed over the long months of autumn. Coco Chanel took charge of the funeral arrangements, filling the church of Saint-Philippe de Roule with white flowers, except for red roses on the white coffin. White horses pulled the white hearse through the rain to Père Lachaise Cemetery. Cocteau, totally devastated, was too ill to attend. What many consider the last major Montparnasse fling of Les Années Folles took place during the spring of 1929, some months before the Wall Street crash. The occasion was a raucous costume party given by Madeleine Onspach at the Bal Negre. Onspach was the mistress of Entre Durin. 
the colourful and by now wealthy painter who adored race cars and who was fully capable of tearing up any bar he was in when sufficiently drunk. Soon the festivities settled into an all-night orgy, with Kiki obligingly doing a semi-topless can-can to the insistent beat of a jazz band, while another woman danced naked on a crate of champagne. Six weeks later, Madeleine Onspach was dead. A suicide. Whether from drugs or depression, it's not known. season formally closes. Everyone is now supposed to leave town. Of the city's three million inhabitants, several thousand probably will. <laughs> <laughs> 